All right. So here it goes. So this is Dolphin Oracle. Uh, I actually tried to get Dolphin Oracle to do uh, a presentation for us, and uh, uh, he's a pretty busy guy. Uh, he said he would consider it. Uh, I hope he does because uh, he is the guy when it comes to MX Linux. And before we continue on, so how did I find out about MX and Antics Linux? So I pay attention to DistroWatch. Now, DistroWatch, uh, you know, people say DistroWatch is trash. It doesn't really reflect what people like because it only really reflects what people vote on in DistroWatch. But it's a metric. What do you want? You know, I, I don't know how you would know what this popular Linux distribution, except that people volunteer what they're running. So that's how I found it. It is consistently, uh, MX, MX is consistently at the top of DistroWatch. I have no idea how it got there. I guess people are the, the people are so enamored by it that they vote for it. So this is how you create it from within Ubuntu itself. Hello everyone, Dolphin Oracle here again tonight, and it's kind of a late night run for me, but uh, I thought I'd take an opportunity um, to uh, do a new series on installing MX. Uh, it's going to include some partitioning, it's going to include uh, writing to the USB. And you might look at this desktop here and say, boy, that looks an awful lot like Ubuntu. Well, this happens to be Ubuntu. I, uh, I always keep an eyeball on what Ubuntu is doing because... You know, why wouldn't you? They're the big boys in desktop Linux, and this video it's is good to uh, see what everybody's got going on. And also to show, uh, you show you happen to be on a different Linux distribution and want to use our live USB maker because of all the persistence type you stuff you get with that, that you can do that. Uh, let me crack open box here. First off, I'm going to plug in my monkey tail USB. There we go. And now I'm going to, yeah, 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 go. Uh, so here I am on the MX Linux download links page. And actually down here in the area with how to get it and the direct downloads and the mirrors and the trials, you come down here in notes and we have this link hidden down in here for the LUM app image. That's our live USB maker. Uh, Peter, quick question. Um, can LUM app images, do those work in Fedora? You know? I'm sorry, what kind of images? Are you talking it says about? he calls it a LUM app image. Have you ever heard of that? A I called app images? I've heard of that. I mean, I know what an app image is. And it, uh, yes, you can make flat, uh, flat uh, flag packs and all that work. Okay. And they'll, and they'll, so, because the, the, what he's getting at here is you download, if you're on another distribution, you download the app image in order to be able to run the MX. Uh, uh, um, USB creator. So I just wanted to make sure because yeah. I, I I hadn't tried it on Fedora. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't know what a LUM app image is. Maybe that's just the name of the app image. But if, I mean, if oh, it's yeah. a special type, then I don't know if that will work. Oh, it's uh, yes, we'll do. You can click on that, and it'll take you to our to our download. You click there and click there. That's the release page and save and what. To my home folder. I always forget Ubuntu's buttons are at the top of the dialogs. So I'll come over here to files. It's a very fast download, or it should be. Almost there. Okay. So we come in here, and as per the instructions on the screen on our on our page with the app image, we can uh, extract. It's a it's a tarball, compressed archive, and it's going to have the app image inside it because it's already can set up to be executable. And now I'm going to go into the terminal, and per the instructions on the web page, it's sudo dot and uh, live USB make. I just, I'm lazy. I hit tab to complete. Okay, and so here we have the uh, MX or an Antics Live USB Maker GUI on Ubuntu because it's in an app image. Uh, we've tested this on Ubuntu, we tested it on Manjaro, we tested it on a few other things. Um, so, you know, hopefully it works out for you if you're on a different. I'm going to select the ISO I want, and that's in MX release because I got every ISO I ever made in here, and I'm going to pick my 19.2 AHS or Oz Advanced Hardware Support ISO. Open that. It's already pointed at my 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 uh, correct USB stick. But if you needed to put it in afterwards, you could fresh and it'll come up. And we're going to go to town. We're going to make the stick. 
This doesn't take very long. Uh, this is probably going to take a little better than a minute uh, to do. Uh, so we'll just call back and let it do its thing. Another thing, Chantix and MX are some of the fastest installed Linuxes I've ever used uh, for regular install, like under 10 minutes. And here we are at 99%, getting ready to finalize live USB. It's been a pretty painless uh, experience here so far. The hardest thing to do is to download a tarball, extract it, and run sudo in the app image name. There we go, live USB is successful. It took about two minutes and six seconds uh, to do its thing. And now all that's set on my live USB is ready to go. So in the next video, I'm going to uh, start setting up my production machine back into uh, my main my main machine. I'm going to be redoing my MX uh, uh, part, mostly because I've done a lot of kooky development type stuff here lately. I'll go ahead and stop that because that's I just wanted to show you all how how you could create it if you really want. You know, after you we've done this presentation and uh, you can go ahead and uh, give it a give it a shot um, he just a couple of comments before I go on to the next video um, it really is easy to make um, I haven't had too many problems um, I've had some issues in the past with uh, with the uh, stick being not erasing but not not specifically because of this particular distribution. So the next, the next one I'm going to go to is I'm going to go to. Let me just look at my list of videos here. Uh, let's see here. And ah, the uh, so this one. Let's see here. So this one is the meat of the process. And it will actually show what the what the distribution what it actually looks like. So I want to do present and we want a let's see here Antics Live at USB configuration and let's see here wait let me sure I get the right video here get for having too many tabs teed up at one time and let me just make sure yes that's what I want all right so I'm gonna go ahead and start this and this is uh, this is about a 20 minute video but I'm gonna stop it so we can talk about it um, but it really does explain what it is um, and then I'm gonna show my own uh, uh, we'll go into some of the stuff on the virtual machines that I've got we'll go here again tonight <laughs> Well, now you've got your brand new live USB that we made in our last video. Uh, and so let's see, you might have some questions about how to operate the thing once it boots up. I have here two of my super secret uh, virtual box machines here that I'm going to show you the live boot screens for the various uh, tools. I'm going to show you the legacy boot uh, menu where if you, this is where you would boot up if you were using, not using UEFI. Machine. I'm going to show you that with Antics, and then with uh, with the MX uh, Live USB, I'm going to show you the UEFI side of things. It's a little bit different. Most of the features are still there, um, and really cool features uh, built into the Grub side of thing, into the UEFI slash Grub side of things. Anyway, with some cool rescue menus that we'll show you as well. So let's start with the Antics. It's the classic. It's going to be in scale mode so you can see it. There we go. So this is the classic uh, live boot for for, for, for antics. Uh, you have the, uh, the, the the legacy boot. You have the various modes. You have the safe video mode that will try to even if your video drivers are older, it will try to load basic or more basic drivers to help you get into X or your windowing environment instead of just the console. Failsafe boots got a, does a little bit more. Uh, tries to really force some things. 
We also have some other features that I'll show you in just a little while. I'm not quite ready for the switch to grub bootloader, bootloader feature yet. I want to show other items. You'll see uh, down here in the in the boot options bar some predefined boot options. Quiet, just kind of shrinks down the number of scrolling text boot messages. That's actually the most Linux systems. And then splash T, that's not a misprint, as some folks have helpfully filed bug reports telling me that it's a misprint. Splash T is the text splash that the Antics Live USB system, and actually MX as well, uses on the live side of things. Uh, it's kind of like those graphical, uh, uh, basically it's going to hide the, scroll, the boot text that a lot of people don't want to see. But the Antics one hides it, it still shows you a little bit of what, what's going on. Uh, just to pause there, um, the boot options, so everything you see have four options you can add to the, uh, to the command line. So. Um, the problem is that when you press F4, you can, you can only choose one option uh, up. But if you you can combine the op together, uh, if you put the if you you put them on the uh, the boot options uh, line itself. So down here at the bottom, we have the usual uh, things. We have uh, F for choosing your language. We have F3 for choosing your time zone. F4 for various other options. Uh, from USB, we'll let, actually it's very if you're. Uh, I've used this in the past on my VirtualBox boot ups at the live system to use the ISO to chain load over to USB. Why do I mention it? That's very key for you guys out there in the Annex world who maybe have an older machine that's booting off a CD, can't boot a USB. Guess what? This will let you boot off, start the boot from the U from the uh, CD. And then head off to the live USB, actually run off the USB. So even if you can't boot off a of USB, you too can access some of the persistence features that Annex offers with a two-part system. Okay, uh, various things you can toggle the auto mount on and off. Uh, there's various other things here, clock. There's some there's some clock stuff. There's the V card menu is very neat. If you have more than one video card, you can try to force using the V card to give you a little during the live boot. It'll try to figure out which video card you want to use. This is somewhat experimental at this time, but uh, it, it's not. It's, it's, it can help some people get the right video card in operation. Uh, one other thing, the i915 invert. <laughs> For whatever reason, this go around, uh, uh, certain video chipsets based on Intel, uh, for whatever reason, when UDEV gets done loading them, it turns the backlight off. Uh, this won't affect you guys on desktops very much for laptop users out there. I have two laptops that do this. Um, and uh, so you can use this invert feature. What actually happens is the screen goes blank and it looks like the thing's crashed. It hasn't crashed, the backlight's just off. So if you use this feature, when UDEV does its thing and loads the video drivers, <laughs> it flips it and so the, it will go bright instead of dark. Um, it's a, a bug in the way the Intel driver uh, the i915 driver uh, handles the backlight. Anyway, that's enough about the backlight. There's some information on the net. Just Google it. You'll find it. There's a bunch of other options here for making safe states, for generating a boot chart so you can see where your boot delays are if you want to, or just see how fast your boot is. Uh, F5 is the persistence menu. And the names have changed a bit, but for the most part, everything's the same. Persist all is going to make a home FS and a root FS persistence file. And load the persist uh, and load the uh, root FS into RAM when it loads. It's kind of like our old default. Persist root is just going to make a root FS file and then load that into RAM when it loads. This is very similar to how Puppy does it. Uh, I actually use this quite a bit sometimes too because I don't always run with a home FS file system, uh, especially if the, if the USB stick's smaller. Um, persist static is just like the, is just like the root except, or persist all, except instead of loading it into RAM when it boots, it's going to run off the USB stick. I actually use this one quite a bit because I run almost all USB 3 devices now and it's pretty darn fast. Is it as fast as running the system from RAM? No. But I, I, uh, for me, I break things a lot and I, I, I just, I've come, to, I've come to like static. And also I use them on, a, on my USB on a variety of systems. Some of them are very RAM strapped. So if you're talking two gigs of RAM on a laptop or a gig of RAM on a laptop, go with the static options that will let you use the files without maxing out your RAM. Uh, P-static root is the same kind of deal, except it doesn't make a home FS file. Uh, Persistent just makes 
a home FS file. It doesn't keep a root persistence file. This is handy uh, if you want to use a live USB, a static live USB for like banking or something like that. But you still want to store files or a Firefox configuration or something like that. All that stuff will store in your home folder anyway, but your root file system will be locked and read only. So that can be very handy in situations. Uh, frugal, the frugal options more or less. So I'm, I'm just going to stop it right here because this is really the meat of the product. So and it took me a while to understand these different persistent options are, and I'll go over them just briefly. So depending upon what your use case scenario and what you need is, is what you're going to choose different persistent options. So persistent underscore all, like you said, creates both a root file system file and a home file system file. And it breaks up the changes that you would make uh, to whichever uh, whichever file is appropriate. Um, persist root creates just a single root uh, root FS file, but your home directory is is basically going to be in that that root FS file. Uh, I use that quite a lot. Um, and then uh, per persist uh, static is like you said. So that's like persist all. So you do get a home FS and you do get a root FS uh, file on the stick, um, but it never loads it into RAM. It, it, the reads and writes are done uh, in real time, uh, you know, to the stick as you're running them. So if you have a fast USB 3.0 stick you know, port, that might make might make make sense instead of uh, syncing changes to them. And the persist home just creates a home uh, a home FS file system, and um, <clears throat> basically, the uh, um, the uh, 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 the rest of the root of the file system is basically loaded from the Linux FS file, which is read only. So that's what he was going under. I do have a chart which kind of explains the different options, so you can play around with, so you can understand what each does. Um, you know, it makes um, uh, understanding them really really will determine what you need to do. And then he's going to go on over what Frugal does, which is interesting what I was talking about earlier correspond to the persist options above but they're meant for options that go on the hard drive okay so instead of you, this would be like if it didn't find the, the, the Google installation on a hard drive in your selection it would make one it would start an installation on it. I've done a couple of videos on that you can check them out the system hasn't changed all that much it works pretty much the same just the code code changed and if you happen to have old files laying around, I think the old code still work in the background. Okay. Now on, so those options are more or less the same on MX versus Antics and versus MX, whether you boot live or with UEFI. This next one is kind of an Antics only. That lets you choose which desktop you want to. I'm going to pause it right there for real quick. Whichever option you choose, um, you don't have to choose the same option every time. But, but understand that, you know, if you choose, let's say at some point past, you choose persistence, uh, persist root, and your home directory was in that, uh, that root file system. I can't remember, but I, if you then choose just all, which creates a, which will create a home FS file, uh, I believe that, um, that, that what takes precedence is if there is a home FS file, uh, I believe that uh, even though um, you still had your home, your home directory, your home file system within the rootfs file system, uh, I'll have to to, um, to test that to be sure because I, I generally only use one persistent and, and then uh, I just kind of kind of stay with that. I don't I don't flip between the different persistence options. But uh, I'll go on here so we can show you what he's talking about here about uh, desktops. As most folks know, Antics boots uh, comes with. Well, actually, four window managers, um, ISWM, Fluxbox, WM, plus Herbst Swift, WM. And then on top of all those things, you have either a Space, space FM desktop, a ROX desktop, or a desktop for the Fluxbox, JWM, and ISWM. Does that sound like a lot of options? It's a lot of options. But here it is. You can select which of the ones you want off of the doodad. The default here give you the, the standard rocks ice WM desktop and this these font options you can kind of sort of play with font scaling a little bit it'll try to blow the fonts up make it a little bit bigger uh, thinking of it as a first step towards HDPI support this is kind of a neat 
a neat idea. It tries to just scale the text up. It doesn't really scale the window elements, uh, uh, but it does scale the text, so at least you need what you're working with. It's surprisingly uh, usable with a window manager system just to scale up the text. Anyway, F7, the console is going to try to give your console the, the black space, the props, the props you get when you don't go into X. Uh, it's going to give it a, um, a, a, con a console resolution. Uh, I, I don't mess with this one. And then the F8 save is going to let you save any of those options you chose into a custom boot menu. Okay, so you, you, you can just, that's all you gotta do, you hit save and you're good to go. I'm gonna start a persistence, uh, uh, let's see, let's just do persist root, uh, root, and then we're going to, I'm going to So just to, just to remind you, the, the persist root creates one root FS file and within that will also exist the, your home file system, the, um, the changes uh, to the root file system. I, do, I got one more little thing here because uh, in VirtualBox, the live USB system is a little bit pokey. So I've kind of spoofed it by making a live USB stick onto the hard drive. So the hard drive in the VirtualBox is formatted like a live USB, but I got to give it one more command from HD. Okay, now we're at enter and it's going to start up. Now, um, here's our text boot. Ah, look, it says, hey, look, we see you want to make a rootfs file. What do we do? So I'm going to create that automatic. Well, I'm custom. Two to create a custom, and I can create whatever size I want. Um, the system tries to give you a suggestion so that you can remaster later. And I'll cover remaster in another video. I've got reaper videos up. But basically, remaster is a way to take the persistence files and the original base file, Linux FS file, smash them all together, and make one Linux FS file and leave you room for a new rootfs file. It's a very handy system, um, and it, it's at the heart of Snapshot. It's at the heart of uh, the, Linux, the anti OSB system, uh, which MX also uses. So I'm going to pop in 14 for a 4 gig, just because I don't really, I'm not going to use this for anything. Do you want to create a swap file? You can create a file. I already know that the, the drive here doesn't really have enough room, so I'm going to say no. It doesn't create a swap partition, it creates a swap file. Now it's going to say, danger, insecure word. Well, that's because now we have live USB with your own persistent stuff on it. You probably don't want to use the default passwords. That's the only thing that means. Don't be frightened. Just give a new password. Give a new password. And we even give you an apology for making you do it. All right, so now we get the, now since I did not, if you choose one of the static persistence options, you're not going to get this. Um, this is an option that you choose when you save the persistence file that goes in the RAM. What happens when you load up the, 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 I call it dynamic persistence file. I don't think that's what anybody else calls it, but that's what I call it. When you load that, what happens is that gets R synced in the RAM. Uh, and then everything load, runs in RAM and it runs real fast. And when you're done, you have to save all the changes that were made to your root file system and RAM back down to the file. So you tr what you happens is, in effect, you speed at boot for speed of usage. It's a good trade-off, especially if you turn your laptop on for a while and never turn it off, or a frugal install, for instance, on a nice big fat hard drive. Uh, this, this works really nice. So anyway, I'm going to, you can choose three different options. Choose manual, which I don't recommend unless you're for debugging purposes, because that means if you don't save it, <laughs> all your changes are gone. Semi-automatic will remind you to save at logout. And automatic won't ask, it'll just do it. Uh, I'm going to choose semi. And there we go, that's all done. Now it's going to start the init system. UDEV's doing its thing. All that was before we ever got to the regular install. That was all inside the Antics uh, live init system. So here we are in Ant. You guys have seen Antics on the videos. I, uh, since I'm in VirtualBox, you can uh, just to point out, take a look at that RAM utilization. It's 136 megabytes. Uh, pretty awesome, I think. See that I'm running with a ETH zero here uh, uh, already. That's that's great and fine. So I don't know. I'm not going to make a whole lot of changes. I'm going to open up the manager here and I'm going to make a new file. Uh, actually, I forget how to make a new file. There we go, new file. And we'll call this new file Fred for a freaking ridiculous alert device. Uh, so here's Fred. And so that's obviously a change. So even though it's in my home folder, 
I don't have a home FS system. I set it up only everything is inside the root FS. So it's and there's now a change that I need to save. But that's not going to save. I'm just going to log out because I cho chose semi-automatic. And we're going to shut down the virtual machine here. Shall we begin? It knows it needs a save, so it's going to say, I'll say sure. <sighs> and here we go. It's, it tells me a summary of what it's going to do. Shall we begin? Yes. I'm going to save. And there we are, nice and saved. And now it's going to proceed to log out. Don't worry if you log out from the prompt or you log out from the console. It's going to catch it. Then, too, it doesn't see the graphical one done. It actually checks twice. It checks once, and if that one hasn't happened, it checks again later. Um, there is, that is one difference between MX and Andix. MX doesn't use local save. It only does it on the console save. We'll show you that here real quick. I'm not going to go through all the options that I did, but I will show you how the system differs. So here we are. This is the UFI boot. See, we don't have all the F key menus, and we don't have uh, the the line for. So he's not. It, a little bit of a difference on that. So you will see the menus if you use MX in legacy boot mode. He's only what he's saying is is that you don't get the pop up menus um, if you're um, don't get the pop up menus if you're using uh, uh, UEFI with with MX. You get uh, you get what he's about to show. We're typing in stuff. It's a little tricky with UEFI world. Um, so I'm going to open up. First off, I'm going to type in a. Before I forget, you can always hit E in Grub. It's just regular Grub. You can hit E. I'm in the one boot command I know I need, which is from HD. Actually, I can't do that yet because that change is doesn't take place till you hit the F10 button. So what I'm going to do is the customize boot option. And then customize boot, I'm going to type in the front HD. And this is going to give me a, whoops, F10 to boot. This is going to give me the menu version. Uh, let me see if I'm, there we go, we can scale that now. This is going to give me the menu version of the function keys. It's quite as, as nice, I'll be honest with you, it's not quite as nice. But for most people that want to enter one, one option from each of the different submenus, each of the different old F key menus, this had. Uh, and I've gotten used to it because I use UFI almost exclusively these days. So I'm going to stick with my default language, but it's the language, you just type in the number. This is the number of columns on your console. I'm the default, it's, I don't know, I forget what the default is, but it's fine with me. Uh, my time zone, pick your time zone here. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to, I've already set that up. And here we have, you see, we have the same mod we had before from the F5, uh, F3 menu, which were the kind of the fancy ones, the, the I-95, I-915 invert. You'll see there's an, there's an invert and there's a no invert, uh, because uh, uh, you can't really, you got to turn it back off from the, you, you got to have a way to turn it back off if you need to, so the, the menu has a no. Uh, the, 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 the live, the legacy boot, you just turn it off in the, in the function menu. <coughs> Uh, but all the other keys are here. Oh, look, I didn't have to enter that from equals HD because it's here in this menu. Good to know. I will remember that for the future. Uh, and again, you have the same saves and, and everything. I don't, I don't actually need anything in this one because I've already entered the from equals HD already. Um, and then the same persistence option that we had under under Annex. So I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with the uh, persist root again. And uh, one thing that occurred to me, by the way, while looking at this, is that um, I guess one advantage of the, UEF, of the UEFI option is that it actually gives you an explanation of what each option does, whereas on the pop-up menu it really doesn't. Three. And there's some scaling stuff, and now it's going to create that. I'm going to let it automatically create it this time. Swap file, no, because I have the same same space restriction. Save these changes, yes. That's the doubt. It's going to give me a custom boot menu option on that grub screen. Uh, so I don't have to do all that every time. The, 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 there'll be a customized entry. And if I ever want to re-customize entry, I just do the customized menu option all over again. So again, the password thing you saw once before. Uh, yes, semi-automatic, fine. And then we're going to boot up into the usual MX environment. After the initial boot menu, boot boot up sequence is essentially the same um, between legacy and UEFI. You just got to get past that 
that initial uh, customization setup, if you any. The top level options is just boot, but all the faults are exactly the same. So here we are with uh, the running MX system. I'm going to do the same thing I did before with uh, in a blank file called Fred. Okay, I don't really need to do that, but it's for illustrative purposes, just to make sure something's changed in the file system. I mentioned that MX does not use the graphical save routine. It doesn't. I'm going to hit the shutdown. But you're going to see what happens as it shuts down on the live system. It's going to ask me. Here it is. Antics save persistent root. Shall we begin? Yes. Here's the same information that the graphical screen gave. Shall we begin? Yes. It does its thing. It R-syncs, and it's done. You won't see those if you use the persistent, or not persistent, if you use the stat options. But that is how the two views from the USB, from the, the legacy and the live USB. Okay, so well, that's I'm not it gonna, for actually booting up. I'm not going to force any more videos on you yet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this. So what I'm going to do now is uh, to kind of drive home uh, a little bit of what, what he did. I'm going to share with you uh, uh, my Linux box. I'm going to go through some of the things that he did. Um, to kind of show you and to kind of and also to drill into the files you can kind of understand uh, what it's doing so uh, let's see here uh, I want to share the entire screen for right now and all right so you all can see my entire screen so I'm actually running uh, that's kind of weird it won't let me well I guess it doesn't really matter so uh, what I'm going to show you so I'm going to show you, let's see, I'll just put this down here. Um, so this is the MF USB maker like he was showing before. And uh, I'm running actually MX21, uh, which actually came out yesterday. MX21 is brand spanking new. Uh, just came out yesterday. So uh, if you're looking to try out MX uh, Linux, now is the time to do it. Antics usually follows, since they're, they're, they're both basically the same engineers. Antics takes about a month for them uh, to, to release a new version of, uh, of Antics uh, 21. So what I'm going to do is, uh, here's a live, live USB maker. You can see that I've chosen uh, my, uh, my Sandus. I'm going to select the ISO. I'll go to my downloads folder. And here's the Antics full ISO. And I'm going to click open. And um, so, uh, full versus image mode. So, image mode is, you know, you could do any Linux distribution if you wanted to. Full feature mode is going to uh, allow you to have that persistence options. Percent of USB to you, um, why would you want to do less than that? Well, um, good question. I'm not quite so sure um, because uh, as part of creating this live persistence USB option, it does create a mount file system that's formatted in a way that you could continue to use the USB on a Windows machine. I'll show you that a little later. So I'm going to do next. This takes really quick to do, so I just thought I'd, I'd go through it. But it, you know, it, it outputs uh, exactly what it's doing. So you can see it's copying over the, uh, the Linux kernel and the init RAM disk. Um, and then what it does is then copy over uh, the, uh, the Linux file system uh, from the ISO. Uh, over to the uh, the USB stick, along with uh, everything else that it needs to do, and um, let's do a few log real quick here. So you know you can actually look to see exactly what it does. You know they kind of provide you with all the all the stuff. You can actually drill down here if you're curious, and you can see exactly what it does, which is really kind of nice because um, you know that's how I learn is by looking at log files, um, especially installation log files that are running uh, uh, you know bash scripts. Uh, that's our uh, that's how I learned Bash, is by seeing how smarter people do things. So this is almost done. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly open up the, uh, uh, the file system and show you what it looks like on the inside. And we wait, 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 wait. And. Checking, checking, checking. It's kind of nice. Although MD5, I guess, I guess they're just making sure that nothing was corrupted. So I guess MD5 is acceptable, even though it's not secure. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. 
And I'm going to, uh, this happens to me all the time. Touch screen is just a little bit too, a uh, little bit too, uh, So I'm going to go down to the Antics Live USB just to show you what it looks like. So everything that, uh, the meat of the Antics Live, uh, the Antics MX Live USB is under the Antics folder. I'm going to show this to you now because we haven't created any sort of uh, rootfs file system. So this right here, this Linux FS, is in fact the um, uh, the entirety of the ISO that. Um, that contains the root of the file system. And that does change unless you remaster it. And uh, like I said, we'll go into remastering a little bit later if we have time, uh, unless I, I bored, you know, we'll see, or I bored people, we'll see. But, so what I'm gonna do now, and of course it gives you, you know, some text files. I'm now gonna boot up, um, I'm gonna boot up, I'm gonna share my virtual box. So give me a second while I stop presentation and, uh, uh, fire up virtual box. There it is. All right. I'm going to start this thing up. And just make sure it's working. And... Hopefully, I don't have to, well, it's okay. If I have to redo it, I will during our meeting, but it shouldn't be a big deal. All right, so I need to go back. It says you're not allowed to share your screen. Why would I not be allowed to share my screen? All right, present. And I want to share a window, and I'm aware of this. Okay, so here is the, Here's the what he was talking about, and um, from here, here's where you would just want to do. So in this case, I'm going to choose F4, and I'm sorry, F5. I have to press Escape first. So what I'm going to do. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, persist root because that creates the root uh, file system. And I'm going to do enter, and that's fine. You can see at the very bottom, you can see it says persist root. Desktop is fine. I, I'm not going to do anything else. Um, I'm just going to leave it the same. Um, and then I'm just going to press enter. If, it, if this crashes, it's because I need to change something on VirtualBox. So please excuse me. So let's, just, uh, so let's just do that. Ah, good. It's working. So I'm going to get rid of this pop up here. So it's going to ding. Ah, and yeah, there it is. That's good. So, this is just because um, you don't you don't always get this. Uh, the best the best option is just to press enter. Um, it's just giving you an option as to which partitions are available. You generally don't have to do anything about that. Press enter. Now, the first time we've run, there isn't any root uh, file system, so it's gonna it's gonna ask for one in a second. At least it should, unless I made a mistake. Well, maybe I did. Hold a second. I made a mistake. Yeah, I think I, I think I know what I did wrong. Let me uh, shut this down and restart it, and tell my phone to stop. This has to do with VirtualBox. It doesn't really have to do with. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with. Uh, because I want to show you how it asks you those those uh, options. So I'm going to settings, I want to go to USB, and let's remove that. Of course, everything has gone swimmingly up to now, so uh, I was waiting for, my, uh, for something to go wrong. Let's see here. If you do end up running this in back virtual box and you have a USB 3.0 stick, I do recommend that you change the uh, uh, that you change the uh, uh, option so that it's uh, uh, USB 3.0. It'll be much faster. All right, let me just go ahead and boot this up. And give me a moment. Oh, I know wrong. Ha! I know what I did wrong. 
mode, and I'll show you what I did wrong. Because I was running. Present and window. I'll show you what I did wrong. So, uh, if you remember correctly, in the very beginning of the meeting, he had talked about how you could bootstrap a CD, um, bootstrap a USB from a CD. So, I'm, the, the, the boot menu, because I'm running off a virtual box, the boot menu is actually running off the ISO. But I want to actually, I want to transfer, I want to transfer over to speed stick. So what I needed to do, and I, what I forgot, was I need to say from USB. All right, and then persist option. I'm gonna, I said persist root, so I say persist root. All right, and then I'm going to press enter, and it should ask me to create the root file system. And that's because I didn't add the USB. So one more time, guys, and then we'll get it right. Sorry about this. This is a, this is all because of virtual, me trying to get VirtualBox right. I forgot to add the uh, USB stick. <laughs> Let's see here. And click OK and start. And do it one more time. And window, and one more time. Yay. All right. Capture. All right. So uh, F, F4 of my options from USB. And wait a minute. Let me get rid of this pop up. And uh, F5 options with persist root. All right, so we've got, just to make sure, we've got our, from USB, we've got our persist root. And I'm going to press enter. That's exactly what I want now. So here's what I was talking about before. So it says the root of S file. So how big should you make it? That's a very good question. Um, you know, it depends on how much of the stick you want to have available. Um, for uh, for other uses, and how much updates you think you're going to uh, you're going to have. Um, what to consider is that the rootfs file system takes up space, and the Linux file system takes up space. Um, and as you as you do app get updates to your to your uh, system, the, the new packages will get installed into rootfs. And um, so if you update a package, say let's say updated fim to a later version. The update takes precedence because it's loaded into RAM disk from the root of for the root file system, but the old package still exists as the original in, in the original Linux file system. So you actually have two packages on the USB stick. It takes up extra space, which is why you remaster. When you remaster, you take everything within that root of that root FS uh, file and you uh, get merged back into the Linux F, uh, um, um, File which is then squash FS to reduce space, and then everything in the root FS file system is then blanked out to give you more space. But uh, so I'm going to say create uh, fault, and it's creating ext4. Uh, I'm not going to create a, a live swap file because it takes time to do that. And you know it's got my asking for the root file for the root password. And the demo password. Now you can create more user IDs. You don't have to do root and demo. Um, you can make it, and you can actually make it so that it, uh, so that it, um, you can actually make it so that, you know, so you can it'll log in as not demo, but as some other user. So um, it's not going to ask me if not, you know, what do I want? I'm going to say like he did semi semi automatic. Now it's going to boot up into antics. And I'll do just briefly what he, he did as well. Wait, 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 wait. It's kind of 
Oh, weird how VirtualBox blanks out. So you can see down here, if you look at the memory use, pretty impressive, huh? 126 megabytes. That's nothing. I mean, that really is nothing. Um, and then at this point, you know, you can do what you want. Now, uh, MX is a little bit nicer when it updates. Um, uh, Antics, you know, there's a there's a control center for Antics. Um, and, you, gotta, you know, if you're not going to do it from the command line, you can do it from software Antics updater, which basically doesn't have yet. So I could do like this. But I don't want to do that because there's probably going to be a bunch of updates. So I just want to do one. So I'm going to open up the terminal here. All right, I'm going to say apt get. I'm going to do them because I think, um, I'm sorry. All right, so uh, let's see here. Uh, well, that's interesting. Maybe it's already there. Yeah, I guess it already is. Well, anyway, if you want to, what I want to do is I want to make a change here. So let's install. Just something to install here. Good. Uh, all right. All right. No. Hold a second. I'm going to try. Uh, oh, man. I'm really, I'm really showing. Uh, you know what? You have to do update first. This one, you know, you have to remember what you're doing, uh, you know, in, in antics because, you know, it kind of depends that you know what you're doing. In this case, I forgot to do an app get update. Let it do its thing. And now I can probably do Vim. You can see it'll, it'll install the, the big version of Vim because you need color syntax and the small version doesn't do it who can who can run them without without color so now that it's done so, so now what you need to understand is is that now that new package is now inside the fest and in fact I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop presenting this and I'm gonna present uh, the entire screen again and just to, sh just to show you what I'm talking about, that there's now a root file system there. Oh, you know what? I guess I would have to stop running it. I would ha well, actually, I would have to do it. I actually, I would have to show. I would have to show it to you uh, within the virtual box. So let me just do that. Real quick. Sorry about that. See, it pays to uh, it pays to test this stuff if you embarrass yourself. But uh, whatever. So let me go back to uh, let me go back to antics and kind of let's just go and open up files. So this is the this is the the live USB storage. So if you go, let's see here. We'll actually show it to you because it's mounted. All right. So you know what? I can show it to you. I can show it to you after we're done. But at this point, so when you're done, you know, we'll go ahead and log out and we'll shut down. Shall we begin? Uh, I'm going to stop on some of these so that, because he didn't stop. So this kind of tells you, you know, the reported file system space is 7.81 gigabytes, total 7.03. Um, I guess there's some, you know, there's 800 megabytes of stuff in there. Uh, used root file system one megabyte. I see where the extra space is coming from. Maybe there's some something in there that I don't know that I don't understand. But anyway, it, it kind of tells you um, how much is going to be saved into that system space. So in this case, it looks uh, says uh, you know required 59, approximate transfer is 58, um, and then uh, you know tells you the total space involved. And we say yes. Now our sync is going to run. It's done. All right. So now it gives you how much total space it used. So it used 102 megabytes. We'll click OK. Now I'm going to go ahead and just I'm just going to shut down here. And starting. And then when I stop, when I when this thing shuts down, then I can go into the actual. There it is. I can go into the actual 
a live USB and showed you what I was talking about before. Uh, so let's see here, entire screen, and we'll go back to share. All right, so. All right, so now if we go into the antics folder, you'll now see that there is a risk file system. Now, if you chose persistent all, you'd see both root FS and home. If you chose persistent, persistent static uh, root, or static root, you'd see a root file system, but it wouldn't get loaded in the RAM disk first when you first load up. So this is kind of a, the, the meat of how it works. And it's actually quite, now, uh, there are some other options for remastering. Uh, if you go to the MX, so I'm going to show you an MX, um, which is a little bit different than the uh, antics menus. But you can see there's live USB maker. Uh, I'm going to find snapshot, the uh, remaster. Well, I guess they don't have it. Uh, I think that might under actually one of the other options. But anyway, um, you know, you have a bunch of options here that you can choose, which are kind of nice. Um, and what I'm going to do now, my other computer has gone into sleep mode because I've talked so long, is uh, I'm just going to stop it here and just anyone, if they have any questions thus far about um, some of the stuff that they've seen, I know I've thrown a lot at you, but uh, it's kind of interesting. Is anyone else before I go on to um, the other shorter video which shows remastering and that kind of explains a little bit more about what I'm talking about and how it works because it really does kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, um, explain that. So Doug, and, and you may get into this a little later, I'm still trying to figure out when do I want to do this? I mean, what's yeah. driving me to, to do it this way versus other ways? You mentioned a couple of times you're very fascinated by the low memory consumption. But uh, other than that, are there any other, I hate using the word use case, but I'm just trying to figure out when would I need to do this or when should I do this in your opinion? So that, that's a good thing, you know. Um, so obviously, you know, the the use cases for the boot for the boot menu options, you know, choosing the you know the different uh, different window managers, uh, to uh, being able to get around some of the bug issues with the i nine nine one five. That's a pretty specific use case. Um, but you know, a lot of the, so the persistent option, that's one thing. Um, I have found that doing the equivalent stuff with the other live systems isn't. There aren't quite as many options, and it isn't quite as easy to, um, like, I can't, you can't split things between root and home file systems on the other systems. I, now, I, I can't, I haven't used the other live USB sticks uh, systems um, in a while, um, but I do, if I remember correctly, you know, the, the, MX, the MX and Antics guys have done a lot more on the, uh, on the, uh, the boot menu options when it comes to, to easily selecting options that you want. As to which persistence options you want to use, that's all up to taste. I, you know, I'd have to, to think about it because I don't have, you know, maybe you would want to keep uh, this file system locked, um, you know, and you wouldn't want to update, but you do want to change your home your home folder. Um, it's a little bit different in the way in which they do it. So what I'm, I'm going to go into the, the, the remaster system because it kind of explains a little bit more. Maybe after watching this video, maybe you'll understand a little bit more about how it works and, and when you want to do it. Um, so I didn't, people, an, didn't answer your question exactly, uh, Peter, but I understand what you're getting at. Some people use it to remaster a system so that they can share it with other people, have a roll your own distro kind of thing without having to make the distro from strat, scratch. Yeah, right. And you can do that. In, in, in the next video I'm going to show, one of the options is remastering for as, as, a, as default remastering as personal. Um, so now, like I said, when you do an app get update, um, all the changes are changed are saved to the root FS file system. So, you know, in effect, you can um, you know you can go ahead and um, um, you can go ahead and uh, um, you know you, when you 
reboot, always going to be there. But what you're talking about, so the way I would do it with MX is that um, I would remaster the stick with all the changes that I wanted, and then I would relaunch the live MX USB creep. And there's an option there, which you, which you probably don't remember, but I, I, but I do now that I see it. It's called uh, Clone Live System. So you can have two USB sticks, one on one side of your computer, and, one there, and you could say, I want to just clone the live USB system that I've customized on one stick over to the other one. And then you can just give it to somebody if you wanted to. Are there any opinion that it's better to put all this extra stuff in a root FS or whether to have a minimal system in the root FS and then have something else you load with your extra files? Well, you know, that's a good question. I mean, so one danger of not remastering on occasion. Oh, oh I see what you're saying. Um, uh, whether or not you should you should have your home directory merged into the root FS to the root file system, or whether you should have everything just mashed into root FS. That's a very good question. I mean, you know what? That that almost goes back to you know in the old days. And Dan remembers this. Uh, you remember, you know, that there's two systems administrators when it comes to file systems. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to well, I won't say two types, but you know, uh, where you split your file systems and it's you know mount points and you, you know, and each has different sizes, you know, so you have a different file system for, you know, for far live, you have a different file system for maybe something else. And then there are people that just like to dump everything and just be done with it. Uh, I hated splitting my file systems up because I hated the fact that at some point I would run out of file, I would run out of space on one of those file systems, I have to redo, rejigger things to fix it. So I got lazy and decided to dump everything underneath underneath root FS because then I figured I would never have to worry about about resizing my my partition space. Maybe there's something similar in that thought process as to whether or not you'd want to dump everything under home uh, versus root FS. But you know, also the, you know, backing up purposes. You know, you know, maybe you want to copy the home FS file system. You could copy that file off the USB stick to anywhere. You could you could you could copy it back onto. Uh, another remastered stick if you wanted to. So there's there's one advantage using it there versus the other. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, this little one, and I will stop it if I need to. Uh, I shouldn't need to on this one, but you never know. Uh, let's see, a remaster your Antics Live USB. This video is a little bit older, but it still encompasses everything we need to know. Hi, everyone. Dolphin Oracle tonight checking out the remaster system in Antics uh, 17. Now what is Remaster? Remaster allows you to take changes to the live e persistence files, ball them all up, cram them into the initial uh, Linux squash file system file. That's the compressed file system. And free up all that space in the root persistence file so you can make new root persistence files. So now you can see the six gigabyte limit on persistence files isn't quite so onerous. Before we get started, I'm going to crack open my file. There's the limit. It, that was in seven. And I'm going to go into the live boot directory. Let's see, live. Okay, yeah, I didn't think I got. I gotta have a root window. There we go. Root live, and in the boot device folder, this is what top level of your USB stick looks like if you just cranked it open. And what you would see is this. This is a, a loot mount, I guess. So we can see what's in on our stick, even though we're using the USB stick to run our file system. I am running live right now. This is my actual live USB that I'm using. Uh, this isn't the one I created in the uh, the earlier video with the with the creating the USB. This is my actual main stick. So if you go into live USB storage, that's where it stores files outside of those persistence files already. So if you've got big stuff like movies or virtual box stuff, that's a good place to put it. You're going to see the EFI boot folder. That's what allows us to boot on EF, UEF systems. You're going to see the boot folder. That's going to be your standard legacy boot stuff. Also Grub, which is used by, uh, is what is used on, on, on UEFI instead of Syslinux. But the, what we're looking for is the antics folder. And the Antix folder contains several items. What we're interested in right now, the state file, the state folder controls things that it doesn't matter if it's persistence or not. It's going to save things like your sound state or your network interface information. A few things that make life a little bit easier uh, so that when you do another computer, 
uh, or on your same computer or whatever, uh, those files load and it's kind of seamless and you don't even have to worry about persistence all that much in a lot of cases. Um, that is one that I that I didn't get into, and I didn't actually realize that was there. I, I had always thought that if you didn't use persistence, that you had to, re to redo your your Wi-Fi configuration every time you loaded up the stick, even if you didn't use persistence. Evidently, that's not the case. They keep some minimal stuff in state uh, that allows you that even though uh, you know you you don't use persistence, you don't have to to, to put the Wi-Fi uh, password in or Wi-Fi maybe not password, but Wi-Fi uh, information in. Uh, every time, uh, like which NIC card, and it and it stores it based on machine, uh, which is interesting. So, uh, but I didn't go into that because uh, I just learned it. It saves them on a general and per, per machine basis, so that's kind of nice. Some things are per per machine, like network interface stuff. And some things are general, like I actually don't know sound stuff probably. Well, let's see. Let's take a look. Let's take a look and see general files. Let's see. Oh, some network interface stuffs in general. Okay, fine. So that's not what we're interested in right now. What we're interested in right now is looking at root FS. That is the root persistence file system. You can see mine's 5.9 gigabytes. I use the six gigabyte option available in Live USB Maker. You can see home FS 3.9. I took the default four gigabyte in Live USB Maker. And then one more thing too. He says uh, the option in Live USB Maker. So now that. You don't choose. Um, so in the in the live USB maker that you run that I that I showed, uh, there isn't the option to choose the, the root FS uh, size. Um, you know that's obviously done on boot up boot up the USB stick. I think he's referring to um, when you remaster. So um, it might also be something that was changed because this is Antic 17 and not 19. But this file is the file you get if you just make a system. And you can see that mine is over a gig. Um, the Linux FS system is over a gig. In fact, I have the virtual box running with the file system. Let's see here. Do, do, do. Not if it was near us. It's got, okay. it's got you know, a metro as its backdrop. I wonder if he lives in this area. Anyway, this the Linux file system is the, is the file that you get when you when you make a live USB stick. That's what's extracted from the ISO and put on there. So this is the original file. You see, mine's a little large. The Antix US live USB uh, the Antix default Linux FS file system file. It's going to be somewhere around 700, 780 gig megabyte. That's because I've remastered this system once already. And I'm going to about to do it again. I've had some updates. Uh, I'm going to roll those things up in with the remaster tool. And that's what this, the files are going to change. The rootfs file is going to go away. The homefs file is going to stay or go away, depending on what I choose. And the linuxfs file is going to shrink or grow on, on the contents of all those files when they get swooshed back together. Okay, so I'm going to close that, and I'm going to go down here to Applications. And I believe it's in, actually, I think it's, this one's in the Control Center under Live. Is under Remaster Customize Live. Yes, yeah, so what kind of remaster do you want to do? General or personal? Now, I believe personal will wrap up your home folder stuff. I'm going to do a general. So he says that he doesn't use personal that much, but I don't, you know, I mean, I, I want all my stuff, all the changes user IDs and passwords and stuff to get to get rolled back into the stick. I mean, if you choose general, it's going to ask you to to it's going to ask you for new root and demo passwords. And it seems to me like um, you'd only want to do that if you want to create a new stick that you're going to give to a general audience and not someone personal. Let's say files under slash home the new remaster. Uh, no, I don't want to, but you could. Uh, the following files already, I mentioned I already did this once. So rootfs old and linuxfs old, uh, they may be left over. Do you want to fix it now? The alternative is yes, I want to fix it now. Okay, should it be deleted? Yes, just delete the thing. Not anymore. And I don't, I can delete the old Linux file system file as well. Now here's a little slight bug and it's caused by, uh, well we're not sure what it's caused by. We're thinking GT, uh, GTK, GTK problem with, with, with some of the, uh, 
some of the dialog boxes. Uh, so if you use the, uh, you can just move this up. I use right alt and move it up there like this. Yes, I'm ready to begin. So it's going to compress it with gzip. Fine. Do you want to remaster using all the CUs? Yes. Give it a title. I don't care about title. And now the, prog the remaster is in progress. Now it's going to take a while. This is a dummy progress bar here, but if you look up here, you'll see this thing starting to creep across. It's got a lot of information. It's taking, right now, it's taking the Linux file system fi file, which is a, that one gig file I showed you, and the rootfs file, which is taking all the changes inside that six gigabyte file. Now, there's not necessarily six gigabytes of information in there. That's just what size the file is that stores all that stuff. It's going to push all that together and spit out a new Linux file system file. This is going to take a little while. I'm going to pause the video because otherwise boring progress bar. Be right back. Okay, so there we go. Uh, on the USB stick, about two, and a, two minutes, three minutes there to run. Um, I'll just point out that if you're doing this on a USB 2 system, it will work. Uh, however, it will take uh, a bit longer than that. USB 3 is this kind of thing with its increased throughput. Um, it just everything takes a little longer on USB 2. They do mention that if there's a new problem with the system, you can use the rollback boot option to return to the system. Do you want to make a new rootfs file now? Yes, I do. And you can choose from a menu what you want. I'll take the 6 gig. Thank you very much. Created. My home was already created because I picked the general. So it's still good to go. If I open up the file manager now. Now remember, right now, those files won't go into effect and reboot. Right now, it's still running the original. So let's see here. Boot dev. Whoops, I forgot I have to be root to get into those window, the folder. Uh, da, 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 live boot device antics and you can see there are now new there's the new one that'll be used the next time I boot it'll ask me if I can want to move it over I will say yes I can't show that because this is actually the running live system instead of the virtual box system so I can't actually show you that that process but it's very easy just ask some question remastering done it goes uh, there's the current one, there's the new one, and you can see there's the current root FS, and there's the new, new root FS. That'll be turned into FS old. Uh, I believe you saw those earlier, but I deleted them. So that, anyway, all the changes to my system, all the apps I've installed, I've installed a few. I've got Chrome, I've got, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I've got something else in here. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got Simple Screen Reporter, of course. Uh, all those changes that, and the apps I've installed uh, will be rolled up into that system and that will be available to me on the next reboot. So why is it important? Why do you want to remaster? Well, when you use a root FS file system, when you use root persistence, not persistence, when you make updates, like when you do an app get update or whatever, you pull down regular system updates like you do, those files don't replace the, in the Linux FS system. Those files go in, all have to go into the persistence files. So when they go into the persistence files, essentially, all, essentially a lot of those files take up double space. So LibreOffice updates. Well, LibreOffice takes up, you know, a gig or something on your stick. It's, it's not that big. Whatever. It's, it's several hundred megabytes on your, in, in your regular Linux system. When you update it, that old LibreOffice is still there, but the new one is in the persistence, it goes into the persistence file. So that effectively doubles all the storage. You do this for a while, but eventually you're going to need, you should remaster to enhance performance, uh, number one. And number two, to clean out that persistence file so that you have another persistence file. You know, now I can take that six gig persistence file I had. It's empty. It's gone. Everything's rolled up into the new Linux FS file. Uh, and so that's available for new stuff later on down the road. So you users, do the remaster occasionally. It's a good maintenance tip. You know, if, if a big update comes down, if Debian updates and you get a big, you know, 500 megabyte update, that's a great time to do a remaster. It really is. Anyway, Zimix Remaster, you got any questions? Throw them in the show note, in the, in the post below. And I will stop the sharing. And that is pretty much my presentation. I just thought, uh, thought I'd share with you guys uh, this, this kind of interesting distribution 
Um, you know, antics at MX Linux can be found at these. Uh, where's, my, where's my slides? Bring up the slides. Uh, present. Let's see here. Window and slides. Bring up my slides again. So, Antics Linux, mxlinux.org, you can get to. Uh, you, you know, uh, one I distribute, if you, if you find, if you go to YouTube and type in Run with the Dolphin, uh, there's all Dolphin Oracle's videos. Uh, you can search for USB. Um, you know, uh, it's really is, it really is quite nice. I mean, you know, there are a lot of really great distributions out there. You know, Antics is not the only uh, low, uh, low system performance. I mean, there's Puppy Linux, there's a bunch of others. I just, just I find that updating them it tends to be a bit onerous. And this is really quite good when it comes to updating them. And, you know, I can, I can customize it exactly how I want. It runs really great. And uh, I've, I've been pretty impressed with it. So, you know, uh, um, if anyone has any questions, you know, you can email me, you know, uh, uh, you know, doug.bagedit.com. Um, I play around with this stuff. Uh, you know, I use Antics. Uh, I have an old uh, Asus uh, EEPC. This is like a, an Atom processor that my mother, that I bought my mother about 10 ago. And uh, I couldn't get, you know, the, 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 the Linux distro that Asus, that Asus uh, kind of made with this kind of, uh, let's go ahead and stop. That they kind of made uh, didn't um, update it anymore, and I needed to put a Linux distribution on it, and so uh, I put Antics on it, and it worked great. Uh, even though even though the keyboard is so freaking small that my fingers can't really type on it that well, uh, but it worked great. And um, uh, you know, and, and the, the storage on it is slow, so uh, I could use the two RAM option uh, on the command line for Antics USB, which is the Linux FS file system completely into memory. Um, and then that, then it ran even better, uh, which was really nice. So uh, you know there is there are use cases. A grant is a pretty narrow use case, um, and computers are getting faster all the time. So uh, I don't know what use a, a small footprint Linux distribution is when computers are getting faster and faster and faster. But you know I'm I'm all about saving CPU and space. So uh, anyway. Um, that kind of answers one of my questions. But I was actually wondering about running this on a um, phone or a tablet. Well, I mean, you know, uh, it depends on what on what the tablet is. You know, most tablets are going to run either and you know, if they're not, if it's not an you know an Apple tablet, it's going to be Android. And of course, Android right. is Android is really designed for. Uh, you know, for you know, full systems, but it's not a full Android. It's not a full desktop system. There are some weird Android uh, uh, forks out there that have tried to do Android with desktop, and I've seen Android used in appliance in, in video appliance in appliances as well. In fact, I was in a I was in a I was in a demo on Friday uh, with a company who was trying to show us their their Zoom product, uh, Zoom a video product. So I'm a video conferencing engineer called from a company called Neat. And uh, their appliance was running. Uh, uh, is, it was Android, basically, uh, customized version of Android. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you'd be able to run this on a tablet. I mean, maybe you could run it on, a, you know, like a Surface tablet. You know, if you wanted to. I don't see why you couldn't do that. You know, but as for you know, an old tablet. Yeah. It all depends on whether or not it can run a standard Linux distribution. If it can, I don't see why it wouldn't. You know, this is just a standard Linux distro. It's nothing really special from it. That standpoint. I, I was using an anti on netbook when my um, when my drive broke, so it was it was a lifesaver. You just boot it, boot it from the USB. But if you want like something specifically for a phone that's different hardware, I have some Linux distros that they are making specifically for phones, and they're yeah. not Android. Yeah. I, yeah, I looked at Lineage OS and um, something like, but I'd never heard of these two, so I was just curious. Yeah, I don't think Antics they're really... isn't usually a phone distro, but if you need need one, I can hook you up with someone who's working on something. Also, too, it's not so. Uh, I don't know why I'm holding this. Uh, Antics is Intel only. Um, you know, so you know, the, the, there have been people ask about, hey, you know, I'd like to run this on on like a Raspberry Pi two or three, you know, which is ARM based, which you think. They would jump on because, you know, you know the so although the four is now powerful enough that you can have a full desktop on running on without any you know performance issues. The two and the three are really are quite underpowered when it comes to, you know, in desktop. Although Raspbian is pretty pretty low, you know, overhead. You know, I don't know if Antics would do much better on a Raspberry two or three. 
uh, you know, uh, or maybe you'd want to run Raspbian, uh, you know, Antics command. You can run. You don't have to run Antics as command, you know, in GUI. You can run it as, as console only, you know, and uh, you know. So maybe you want to run that on a Pi One or even a Pi Zero, you know. So I don't know, but um, you know, I would like to see them port uh, this product, this this distro to ARM. I really would. Um, you know, I find it find it kind of nice. Uh, also, the, well, I didn't do this, but you know, they, they do curate their the applications to make sure that, that, that they run. So Antics and MX, if you go into their uh, popular applications um, um, tab, the software installer, you know, they often backport things to run uh, right out of the box, uh, you know, without any issues, you know, for Antics and MX, uh, you know, which is really quite nice. And also, they're, they're quite open uh, to getting things running. I mean, uh, uh, there was a backport there was a backport. Uh, well, that's true. Yes and no. Um, so, so um, Antikeen was based on uh, an older version of Debian, of Debian, and I wanted to run the latest version of, uh, of a program that that of a game uh, framework runs the, the old Ultima games, and uh, I couldn't get it. I, it wasn't available in the Debian in the Debian in the current Debian repository, and uh, um, I uh, I wanted to. I wanted to get that. I wanted to get that on the latest version. I said, "Hey, can I have this?" And they, they within a couple of minutes, they packaged it up and stuck it on the, stuck it in the in the uh, testing repository for me to use. System D, yes and no. Um, well, I'll say yes with a qualifier. So MX Linux, you could use it either in System D or non System D. Uh, have if you run it in non System D by default, it has shims, you know, but. There are some things that don't work unless you boot into System D mode. Uh, one of those, uh, like uh, I use ID, and that that is System D only. Uh, the, the the shims that they put in just won't work without System D. So you can't boot it into System D. They are not. They they are pro. They, as a distro, or anti System D, but they're not anti System D to the point where they don't support it and, and don't have it as an option if you want to boot into it, which is nice. It's like, you know, this is our preference, but we're not going to force you down this road if you don't do, or if you have a specific requirement that you need in order to be able to run System D, you can run System D if you want. So I think I think that's that's kind of nice. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, I am, I am, personally speaking, I, I'm, you know, I, I started using Unix a very long time, and I and I, I kind of agree with the, hey, you know, I don't want I don't want one thing, you know, controlling my whole system. But at the same time, I have to recognize that System D has been pretty solid over the last, you know, how many years, and all the distros have kind of moved to it. So, you know, it's kind of a fait accompli when it comes to, you know, where you know a System D is basically what everything is running, and and you know the old System Five. You know, way of doing things is just not, you know, you know, it's gonna go. It's not, well, it's not gonna go away, you know. But, you know, it's 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 gonna be there. But, you know, I like the fact that Antix lets you do both, and that's cool. You know, you don't have to choose either or. You can choose both. You can you can run. You can boot in one mode and you can boot in the other if you want. It's great. So, you know, either one. I had a question, Doug, and I, I don't know if you came across this while you were researching all this, and anybody else weigh in also. Um, if I can update it, that you can change it, you know, update the persistence. And it, do you add, do you run into issues like moving it from system to system? Like, do drivers get mixed up in conflicts and so? No, like, no, no, you know, I, I, uh, no. I mean, uh, Antix and MX does a really good job at detecting, uh, you know, hardware and and making the appropriate the appropriate you know thing. I mean, you know, uh, I've I've had a USB stick and. And let's say I have an NVIDIA card, and uh, there is an option for installing the NVIDIA drivers. And when I plug that into the system that has the NVIDIA card, it uses the NVIDIA drivers. You know, when I plug, when I take that system, that that USB stick, and walk it over to another computer without it, it you know, it, it doesn't seem to have any problems. So I've been pretty happy with it. You know, that that thing of detecting hardware and and, and doing uh, and doing the right thing. You know, Linux is Linux in general. All distributions have gotten. Are so are really great at that, you know. They are. I mean, um, you know, Nopix is a little bit different. Nopix doesn't. It, it was the beginning of that, of it kind of where it investigates, you know, what's going. Tries to make intelligence decisions. But you know, I've been pretty happy. I haven't had any problems with that. If that answers your question. 
Yeah, cool. Because that, that that's like the part where you take seven C for something like this is carrying it around again. So you have it to troubleshoot or just load yeah, up your no. environment wherever you're at. Like I said, you know, if you think you're going to access both 32 and 64-bit hardware, you might want to have both systems, uh, you know, on the USB. Or if you want to have both Antix and MX, let's say you want to have both 64-bit versions of Antix and MX because, you know, you may want to boot into Antix one and then you may want to boot it to MX another. I'll have two USB sticks if you want. But it is possible to have both systems on the same stick. Uh, I was reading in the forums. They did kind of explain how to do that, and I haven't tried it yet. But I'm like, well, geez, you know, I had a 28 gigabyte USB stick. You know, I, I want to I wanna have both on the same stick, so I don't have to have two sticks at the same time. You know, yep. so um, I don't know how remastering affects whether or not it does. Evidently, they say it works fine. I don't know. Um, you know, so but but you know, it's pretty cool. You know that um, you know that you can do that though. Yeah, awesome, thanks. Sure. Uh, any other questions? I'm sure uh, so, Peter's got to <clears throat> talk about the uh, next year, too. Yeah, uh, so that was the whole idea of actually getting to the library. And since I'm still the only one here, that won't happen. I will start something on the mailing list no matter what. So I'm at the end of this. I did have one question, and, I, and if you don't have the answer, it doesn't really matter. But I'm trying, to, I've been trying in my head to figure out how, you know, but take away the idea of a small, small footprint OS, which is what you're looking at, right? You're looking at something that you can run on low end hardware and all that. That's, that's all by itself. Now, the other part of that is how do you then manage an ease installation? And what you're, what you're showing here is an interesting way of, of, of doing it for me, but I was looking forward to hearing how this compares to something modern like OS3, for instance, right? That is trying to solve this same problem, but yeah, I think a little more straightforward without you know, taking you through a lot of the sessions like this. But yeah. I wanted to hear if you had any uh, opinions or, again, I'm going back to the use case. What is it that does yeah. this mix well, there? Here's what I'm gonna do, Peter. Um, I'm gonna. I'm actually. Can, can you email me an exact question, and I'll, I'm gonna post it to the forum because I'm interested as well. I'm sure that there's cases that I don't understand. And remember too, when you say low footprint, you know, remember. So we have two different distributions. Antix is super low, all right, and then MX Linux is designed for mid-range and the high-end computers. So you have two different sets of uh, distributions for two different needs. Um, although there's no reason why you couldn't use Antix on any system. Um, but I think MX, I like MX, well, MX is just a little bit easier to navigate around, whereas mm -hmm. Antix requires a little bit more uh, understanding what's going on, you know, and, you know, well, as you're- And, and that's so, part of what I'm noticing, right? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this going, could I give this to my grandma? And, and, and by no means, no, right? Uh, but, and so that's why I'm asking sort of a perspective. How does this help? You, right? Where, where I'm looking at the live USBs yeah. today, they've more or less been designed to let any idiot, sorry, any uh, admin well, experience I'll, install it and, and, and use it easily, right? Let me let me give you a good example. So, um, you know, I did my presentation on Boink. Yeah. You know, um, hey, I want to have a Boink and Antics Boink USB stick, where Antics is configured, where it's already joined to the projects that I wanted to join to. And I want to be able to run the sick computer that ha might happen to be lying around my route lying around that I get into my office here, right. uh, you know, and, and just run Boink without having to configure it or do it and do it with it. Do right. it. I can do that. Stick. Or let's say I want, you know, I have a really complicated setup. I want all my, my Vim art. I want all my Vim, you know, setups to be done. I want all, mm -hmm. I want all of my environmental variables to be correct, um, you know, and I want a full feature desktop environment. You know, and I want to be able to take it and run it anywhere I want. You know, and I don't want to have to. You know, I don't want to have to start from scratch every single night. Right. You know, I do it. I, you know, I could take. You know, as for Grandma's house, you know, I would never give Grandma antics. You know, I, you know, MX would be more what I would do. You know, like for instance, take an MX stick, and I might, I might modify it after the fact. You know, and then. You know, and then give it to her. But 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 I don't necessarily have to give her the stick. I mean, you know, I, I could install Antics, Linux as a full-featured desktop system. You know, there's an installer which I didn't go through. 
uh, that was on the desktop when you first boot up the, the USB stick mm -hmm. that only takes 10 minutes to install on any computer. So, you know, there is that as well. And, and from that perspective, MX and Linux and Antix, you know, you're just really comparing it with every other distribution out there, uh, you know, when it comes to ease of use. So, you know, those are the, those are the things. But I, I am going to post to the, to the uh, MX forums about use cases, especially, you know, about when you would do rootfs versus homefs and and what other people are using them for you know um you know uh, you know if you didn't want to take a laptop with you somewhere and you just want to keep a stick take a stick with you let's say you wanted to go you were going you were on, t on travel but you didn't want to take a laptop with you but you knew that you knew you'd have access to say a hotel computer you know and uh um but you don't want to use their system you know you could stick this at the back of it and have your entire system you know, right. and, oh, by the way, y encryption. Uh, I did not choose the encryption, but y you could choose an option that says mm -hmm. encrypt, and it'll encrypt the entire, the you know, encrypt the file system so that if you lose the the stick, you know, you're not going to get into your stuff. You know, you could stick this into the into the you know the, the computer that you're that's at the hotel, and you can have everything that you that you wanted to use. All your say you're log you're logged in with Firefox. You've got all your plugins. You know, you don't have to do you don't have to to, to set that up all over again. You know, you can you can fire up your your development environment if you right. want to do that, or your virtual machine if you want to do that, and all that will run just as it would normally run, you know, on you know on any other computer that has the well, resource. Well, that, and that's so, I only want to take up. I also want to close out the recording here. But I was just curious to see sort of the philosophy of of doing this. If you look at an embedded device today. They all have this one firmware partition that is read only, and then they have that copy and write system on top of it. So whenever there's updates, you just replace the firmware, and you still have your copy and write with all your settings, right? So you have those separate. They're not meant to do major updates like an app get and all that stuff. That would kind of yep. defeat the whole problem of doing it that way. And that's sort of the yep. same philosophy of OS3. But you do have two file systems. You have one for everything that you want configuration to be that is per computer, and then you have another one that you can take with you everywhere saying, this is my base. And that base can be updated independently. Yeah. Um, and to me, that I understand that use case, because that, I can use that to create anything that I want to sell, like when I'm in uh, OS on a chip, on a switch, on a router, or on a, in a TV. That makes a lot of us to do it that way. This takes it to a degree where I'm not sure I follow what the advantages are, and that was what I was looking for. No, that's fine. Uh, no, I, and like I said, uh, I, I'm going to ask some questions too, yeah. and see what they have to say because yeah. uh, I'm sure I'll get all sorts of answers. Yeah. I, like I'm going to stop the recording if you don't mind, or unless someone yep. else has a question they want to get on it. Yep. Nothing. Not even Dan.